So if you leave here today with more questions than answers, I will have done my job right. When I was about 13 years old, I had a music theory teacher that tried to teach me about music theory. And then he got upset and told my dad that I will never be able to learn anything because I ask way too many questions. Allow that to detonate in your head for a second and tell me if you get this feeling. What? <laughs> so I kept asking many questions, and I became a professional question asker, which is the definition of what a scientist is. That's the job description, a professional question asker. These questions led to so many different things, beautiful things. This is a subset of them. We made the world's first and most powerful natural biosolar cell using dead grass and dead um, green things, which led us to make the world's first nose that was designed to beat the dog's nose and work the same way, which was this big, and now it's this big, and it's trying to get into your cell phone so it can smell you and make sure that when you get the first instance of melanoma that you don't have to die from this because if you s detect these some cancers early, you can be saved and never have to worry about them again. We accidentally invented the world's first pain detector. We trained Drosophila flies to identify and recognize isotopes, and many more things came out of questions. So clearly for my life, questions are important, but other people have also recognized this. Einstein, you may have heard of. He says he has no special talent other than being passionately curious and that the important thing is to keep questioning. Are questions really more important than answers? How can that be? I'm here to tell you that perhaps yes. Questions are powerful. They drive you to, cre to creativity, and creativity cannot be dishonest. When you're building something to answer a question, the universe tells you whether you're being honest with yourself or not. So curiosity begets creativity, begets honesty, and begets knowledge. And the right answers, the knowledge that you get out of this, are the ones that create more creativity, and the loop keeps going. Don't get married to your answers. They're not you. They're not your identity. Your ideas and your beliefs are not you. You are you. If you really don't believe that questions are that powerful, I will tell you that the internet is here because of a question that was asked two and a half thousand years ago by Lev Kipos and Demokratos standing on a beach in Greece. And they said, hmm, if I break a rock, I get smaller rocks. If I break the smaller rocks, I get sand. If I mash the sand, I get dust. Does that keep going forever? That gave us CERN, the Large Hadron Collider. Out of this, we were smashing atoms. Out of this came the internet. Yes, it existed before. We had ARPANET, we had the infrastructure, but the internet browser is what set fire to the internet, and that came out of there because physicists had too much trouble sharing all this knowledge, and Tim Berners-Lee invented the HTML. We recognize this as scientists, that curiosity is so important, so Myself and several others co-founded the Molecular Frontiers Inquiry Prize, which quickly became known as the Nobel for Kids, because we had 13 Nobel laureates examining questions that we asked the entire planet to send. Anybody under 18 could do it, and we rewarded five girls and five boys for the best questions. We gave them a medal that has our motto, the curiosity, creativity, honesty, knowledge, and um, something interesting started happening. I was the director of this prize, co-founder and director for the first few years, and I watched these questions come in day in, day out, over years. Thousands of them came to myself and I would read them. They reignited my curiosity, but I also watched the ones that were being discussed by the Nobel laureates, and I sat in those rooms and I tried to understand which kinds of questions are the ones that are good, the ones that are really powerful. And it ended up being that the ones that challenge assumptions that look for exceptions, that examine the definitions, and that cross the boundaries, those tend to ignite your imagination, and those tend to produce fantastic results. Note also that I have removed the names of the children who submitted these questions, because questions, unlike ideas, are not patented, they're not owned. You can't have ownership of a question. It's alive. But they are rebel minds, and I let their ages be there. So notice that we didn't care about how well crafted the English was, which we're trying to get to the essence of the thing. 
we found also that the questions that really resonated with the Nobel laureates, with the rest of the eminent scientists, and with the public were the ones that had something about nature. If nature does it, can we take a hint from it? Can we do something like this? A powerful way to ask questions is to ask yourself, can it be another way? Can it be another way? The question asked by this rebel mind, why aren't plants black, drove us and drove my lab to research that is still ongoing, millions of dollars worth of it. We're trying to now create biomass without sunlight. We are trying to genetically engineer and directly evolve algae to live underground and eat the heat, the waste heat of, let's say, the tea. We also found that even though it's hard to approach these scientists in normal life, if you trust your own logic, you actually get results. We as scientists, if we cannot explain to you, or if we cannot answer a question simply and tell you, nah, you know, it's too complex, there's so much math, you need to go to university, have a PhD to understand it, that's the red flag. Always know that that means that we don't get it either. If the math's too complex for you, it's too complex for us too. It is the responsibility of the scientists to explain it to people. And it is hard. I ask my students to give 30 second pitches of what they're doing, and it's the hardest thing they do, and they hate it. And some of them are here, and they know that that's hard. But I have to eat the dog food. I'm talking about questions. So what is a question? The question is the result, the outcome of curiosity. So what is curiosity? It's a superpower, I think. Curiosity makes you reach out. Babies learn about the world by being curious. You learn to drive your own body by trying different things and knowing how to, um, what happens when you touch something. Curiosity takes you out of your shell. It makes you touch something. It is the fear killer. Animals, humans, even single cells, learn by exploration, and the drive towards exploration is curiosity. If you look at the brain and what happens while you're curious, it actually goes by the same pathway as a literal itch. An itch is there to tell you that something's about to bite you. A curiosity itch is there to tell you, you need to pay attention to this. You need to give it life. And how do you give it life? Well, you ask a question. A very wise 900-year-old frog or something said, <laughs> fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, and hate leads to suffering. And we have a lot of that going around the planet today. Curiosity is the fear killer. You cannot be curious about something and afraid of it at the same time. In fact, if you are afraid of something, try and be curious about it, and the fear will disappear. And we say this about science, and yet and we all celebrate curiosity as a joyful thing, and yet in our culture, curiosity is punished. Curiosity killed the cat, the doubting Thomas is the most reviled character in the entire Bible. Not even Judas is worse spoken of than Thomas. Thomas wanted to know, he asked too many questions. Just recently, the spokesman for the White House told us that it's inappropriate to ask questions of a four-star general. And I want to say, well, at how many stars do you stop being able to ask somebody some questions? <laughs> is that three? The powerful are afraid of questions, and you, the youth have a natural advantage over the powerful because you have this innate. It hasn't been beaten out of you yet. Try and reignite it if you're an adult and see what happens. So uh, I have to be honest. I have to be curious. It causes me to be honest. I have to ask myself, when we created this prize, the Molecular Frontiers Inquiry Prize with all the Nobels, this was in 2006, why was that the first time in the history of humanity that we ever rewarded questions? We've always been rewarding answers. Why is that? Why is it that we have these climate change deniers, and we have these debates, and we give them more and more evidence, and we have these people now who say the Earth is flat, and we call them ignorant, and we keep trying the same thing over and over, which is to call them ignorant and to give them data? Well, how many more times do we have to do this before we start thinking that, hmm, who is responsible for this ignorance? Whose job is to invent a new way of communicating and bring us together. Is there another way other than pushing you through books and education that oftentimes the same book is read, the same evidence is seen, and yet different conclusions are made? So how do you remain curious 
And how do you become fearless? Well, first of all, don't panic. And second of all, ask. And if there's no one to ask, ask me. There's a website. You don't need to put your name in. You don't need to give us your email. Just put your questions out there in the universe. And I will read them, and other people will read them. You don't own them, but they might very well be the next thing that saves the world. Thank you very much.